Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is September 17th, 2018, and my guest is philosopher and author John Gray. His latest book, which is the subject of today's episode, is The Seven Types of Atheism. John, welcome to Econ Talk. I'm very glad to uh, be talking with you, Russ. Now, your book, The Seven Types of Atheism, is a fantastic, short, jarring, provocative book. It's jarring to someone who is religious, and I think it's jarring to someone who's an atheist. Uh, At the heart of the book, uh, there are two central ideas, which we'll be talking about today, along with anything else that comes up uh, along the way, the religious nature of uh, most types of atheism and the, yes. and the illusory nature of progress. And uh, I found that second theme uh, deeply disturbing. I, re- I came to realize from reading your book that I had imbibed much of uh, – that I was a child of the Enlightenment. I had adopted many of the uh, the progressive uh, – the view that the world's making progress and uh, – it might be, so I want to give you a chance to defend it, and I'll challenge you at some point. But you do uh, make a very strong case uh, that it may not be. But I want to start with atheism. Uh, you're very critical of the new atheists, uh, Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, and others. Uh, they, they, You say that they bore you and that their view of morality doesn't really hold up. So what's what's wrong with the so-called new atheism? The first thing that's wrong with the so-called new atheism is that there's nothing in it which is new. Um, Most of the criticisms of religion that they advance, nearly all of them in fact, were made in similar but better forms in the 19th century. Um, uh, They, none of the new atheists knows anything much about the history of ideas, even of the history of atheism, they're pretty ignorant. Uh, beyond the last 20 years or so. And so they make a number of criticisms um, which fit into the Victorian or mid-19th and late 19th century dispute about a conflict between religion and science. In other words, they take for granted that uh, uh, religion is a body of propositions or even theories, and that these theories aim to explain the world. And now that we've got science... We don't need religion. It's been superseded or rendered obsolete. But that's a very primitive view of religion, which actually not many people who study religion deeply and professionally, hardly any of them would take that view. If you asked an anthropologist or a sociologist or even a cultural historian about religion, not one of them nowadays or very few of them would think of religions as um, bodies of theories or or beliefs or or propositions uh, which try to explain the world. Religions are, uh, in most parts of the world, throughout most parts of human history, have been composed of practices um, more than of beliefs. Most of them haven't had creeds written down as propositions. Ancient uh, paganism in uh, uh, Greece and Rome, for example, had no creeds, which had an advantage, uh, which among many, which is that there weren't any heretics. You can't be a heretic if there isn't uh, something to be a heretic against. Um, um, what we now call Hinduism, very, very old body of uh, um, belief, of, of practices associated with um, very sophisticated philosophies, has never been summed up in a single body of belief. The same goes from Taoism, for Taoism and Confucianism, Shinto. And for most of its history, you would know perhaps more about this than, than I, Judaism hasn't been embodied in any single list of propositions or, 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 or a creed. So um, most religions haven't been like, uh, don't conform to this new atheist understanding of what a religion is. And there's a reason for that, which is that new atheism 
is a kind of inversion of monotheism, particularly Christian monotheism. It's, it just turns upside down that body of thought by rejecting the key beliefs in it. And new atheists think that if, if they reject these beliefs, then they've rejected the whole framework of thought of monotheism. But my view is that just turning the beliefs upside down, inverting them or rejecting them, leaves most of the rest of the framework of thought intact. And so that's one reason why, although I did only discuss the new atheists quite briefly, in fact, I seriously considered not discussing them at all because I do find them boring and um, and uh, feeble in, the, in their arguments. But I did in the end because most readers did discuss them in the end because most readers, if you say the word atheism nowadays, will be most familiar with figures like um, uh, uh, Dawkins and uh, 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 Sam Harris and uh, the others that you mentioned. Um, I did discuss them quite briefly, but only really to point out that um, they're recapitulating, uh, uh, repeating an argument that went on for several decades, a couple of generations in the 19th century, and coming up with the same narrow and, to my mind, rather parochial view of religion, which is that religion is a an early and obsolete kind of theory that we don't need anymore. And that really doesn't correspond to what religions have been in um, uh, throughout human history and prehistory in, in most of the world. It simply corresponds to a, an upside down picture of Christian monotheism. What's upside down about it? Why do you say upside down? Uh, well, I mean, what, what, what atheists do is they treating uh, religion, even in general, as a um, uh, uh, as a kind of system of beliefs. They say, well, what do religious people believe? And they say they believe that um, um, uh, uh, there's a supreme being that created the God, created the world, God, and created life and humanity, and lays down various sort of edicts for um, uh, how human beings should live. Now, um, uh, the way I think of atheism, and I say this right at the start of the book, is that for me, an atheist is just anyone who doesn't need the idea of a creator God of that kind. You're an atheist if you don't need a... Uh, it's a purely negative proposition, in other words, atheism. It doesn't have to be organized as a movement. Atheism doesn't have to be associated with any particular... Uh, view of the world. It's had several views of the world, many in its in its in its long history, even in, in, in modern times. But an atheist is just someone who doesn't need that idea of uh, of a creator god. But one important thing I point out is that if you think of atheism in that way, that rather simple negative way, then many of the religions of the world have been atheist religions. For example, there's no creator god in Buddhism. There isn't an immortal soul in Buddhism, but Buddhism is a very big and old religion. Um, uh, uh, polytheism doesn't contain a single uh, uh, supreme god. It doesn't. Most polytheist religions of the kind that flourished in um, Roman, in for example, ancient Rome before it was taken over by Christianity, featured many gods, and many of them didn't uh, uh, have any account of the world being created by a, a god, and certainly not by one single creator, one single god. So the idea of, if you take atheism in that way, uh, then there are many atheist religions. And that leads me to one of the um, major arguments in the book, which is that the boundaries between atheism and religion are much more blurred once you have a better and more complex and more pluralistic understanding of what religion is. But we should make it clear that you are an atheist. I am, in that so, sense, certainly. Yeah, so, I, I, yeah. so the book's a little bit, there's an irony in the book, which is it's, it's a savaging in many ways of the illusions that you believe many atheists labor under. At the end, we'll talk about you know, how, how you then reconcile your own atheism with that. But I just want to comment on the, the point you made about atheism versus uh, religion and especially the new atheists. So you're absolutely right about Judaism, uh, of course. Judaism emphasizes action, not solely. There, there are obviously beliefs in Judaism. Hmm. There's emotional things, but Judaism emphasizes a set of obligations a person is supposed to do rather than... In other words, practice. Practice. And there's even a dispute in Judaism whether believing in God is a requirement. Uh, Quite. Some thinkers Quite. and Jewish rabbinical sources say it, it is one of the commandments. Others say, no, you just have to do the, do the things. 
So well, I met one of the last, um, one of the last, rab- not one of the last, but one of the few rabbis in Poland, uh, where, of course, most Jewish people were killed in um, the Nazi period. Um, and he said, he quoted something from his teacher. He said, um, uh, his teacher said, um, don't worry about belief, just practice. And then the second point is the, the, uh, the view that somehow religion is is falsified by, say, science or history. Yes, or, yes. And, and you point out, as by the way, I think uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, former uh, chief rabbi of the United Kingdom, that yes. uh, religion is not created to teach us history. It's not created to teach us science. It's created to give us meaning. And, uh, science, and science is not good at that. Despite the attempts, it's a different thing. It's to help us it's understand the thing. world. It's a different That's fine. It's important. It's, I think, glorious. It's a wonderful uh, expression of human uh, creativity and, and insight. And, and if you're a religious person, you, you believe that, that God created the world so that we could understand it. And, that's, mm. and if you don't, it doesn't matter. You still could understand it, a lot of it, not all of it. Uh, but they're two different things, and I think that's um, that's a very profound. That's an important insight. point. An example I give in the book is that the um, biblical Genesis myth, the myth of um, Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden, and so on, was never meant as an early theory of how life came about on this planet. And I say that quite dogmatically that it was never meant like that, because you can go back an awful long way in the history of Christianity and before Christianity of Jewish thinkers who completely explicitly say that the that Genesis myth is not to be read literally. Augustine within the Christian tradition says that quite explicitly. It's an allegory. That, it's an allegory to teach us something. Sorry? It's an allegory to teach us something. Yes, or it's what I call a myth, which is that uh, uh, I don't use in a bad sense. It, 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 it's an allegory, as you say. It transmits certain truths in the form of a story, if you like, which are difficult to transmit or convey in other terms. And um, the point is that this view of that, myth, of, of that story in the Bible uh, was um, affirmed not just recently under the attacks of the new atheists, but more than 2,000 years ago, hundreds, of, well over 2,000 years ago, by Jewish and then later by um, Christian thinkers. So they have always there have there has been I have to there has been a tradition of literalism sure. in West in Western religion. I don't deny that, and even of fundamentalism. But um, all along, there have been thinkers, theologians within um, Christianity and within Judaism. And I also think, though, it's a subject I'm. Uh, uh, less uh, familiar with uh, may also be true of Islam, but uh, certainly within Christianity and um, and Islam, there's a long, long, long tradition of thought going back almost as far as we can see, in which it's explicitly denied that these biblical stories are theories to be understood literally. Now you argue that we've replaced the worship of God with the worship of humanity, that we've put the God who will transform human beings and, and redeem mm. human beings into uh, a, a, a different myth, which is the mm. myth that human beings will, through the application of reason and science, uh, transform uh, humanity. And of course, much of human history of the last few hundred years is is a tragic example of, of that practice, the Nazis – the communists being in Soviet Union being the most obvious examples. But what about science itself? A lot of people would argue we're doing great. Look how much we've how, how much human suffering and and misery have been reduced through the application of of scientific understanding, through technology, through better economics, through uh, better politics. We're we're heading toward progress. And you you reject that uh, extremely strongly. Why? I do. I do. I reject that view because the view that so many people take there it confuses um, progress within science and progress in the increase of technological power that occurs as a result of progress within science with ethical and political progress, or what I would call progress in the quality of civilization. They're two quite completely different things. As I say repeatedly, um, uh, though it's never, by the way, sufficient to, uh, uh, I, think, I think I say repeatedly and clearly in the book, many times over, 
uh, that there is progress in science in the sense of accumulating knowledge. We know a lot more about many things than we used to do. We have a lot better understanding of aspects of the uh, uh, world around us than we had in the past. Uh, and there's also progress in technology in the sense that technologies as spin-offs from advancing science um, become more efficient and more powerful. Uh, so that's they are just facts. Uh, um, uh, I think so. I reject the postmodernist view, which says there's no. Uh, and I've always rejected the postmodernist view decades ago when I first started writing on these things, according to which science is just a series of pictures of the world, which which differ, but um, uh, none is truer than the other. Uh, there is progress in science, and there's a correspondent pro pro uh, progress in um, in technology. Uh, but uh, human, the human animal doesn't change very much, uh, however much it might want to or, or like to or imagine that it changes. And human beings use science and the fruits of science, the, pro the progressing and advancing fruits of science, to serve whatever goals or ends they have. So, of course, they can use progress in medical science to um, uh, um, improve human health, uh, or, for example, to eliminate hereditary diseases, but they also use it for purposes of um, uh, 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 which are either oppressive or um, or purely destructive. For example, uh, the uh, potential of genetic science to improve the human lot is great, but I'm afraid I regard it as a certainty that if it's not already happening, that genetic sciences will be used to um, uh, from frivolous purposes like uh, trying to uh, produce children who um, uh, are cleverer or more beautiful or smarter or who fit into fashionable ideas of what makes a, a good child. I think maybe that's not a terrible vice, but I regret it um, um, because um, I don't think the next generation should be genetically modeled on passing notions of what's best. But then you get into darker areas where uh, genetic science can be used to, um, um, or could be used in future to, uh, uh, for racist purposes, to edit out to, uh, certain um, groups, human groups, uh, for the purpose of genetic uh, weapons, um, or even for purposes of genocide. And it's a general feature of human knowledge I think this is one of the messages, actually, of the um, one of the lessons of the um, um, Genesis story we to talked about earlier on. It's 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 a general feature of um, human knowledge and of human technology that it can almost always be used for bad as well as good purposes. Now, following a um, a kind of a, a, a maxim of one of the philosophers I knew, although only I only spent, in my earlier life, I only spent one long afternoon talking with him. Karl Popper, the famous philosopher of science, said you should always try and falsify any uh, conjecture or view you put forward. And I don't accept Popper's, I think, over simple philosophy of science, but I, I think it's a very good, very good tip, if you like, if, if you have a kind of strong view. It's starting you should point. Try, good, you should try and falsify it. So I've, I've always thought, tried to think of technologies or advances in science that have been purely uh, um, good. Uh, and I've come up with a couple. It's very hard to think of a downside to anesthetic dentistry. <laughs> yes, unless, unless you hard. believe that pain uh, uh, produces a, a challenge that we're supposed to <laughs> endure and overcome. But yeah, well, I'm, with, but I'm who, with you. There are people who think that, yeah. and I would, I would put in – um, contraception, actually, as well, because although there are people, religious people of various uh, denominations and traditions who I think it's been overwhelming, overwhelmingly benign, those two things, but um, nearly all technologies have been um, deeply ambiguous in their effects, and I've lived through this. I mean, I remember a time back in the 70s and 80s, and I don't regret this, I was a very active, very militant anti-communist. I believe that I was a Thatcherite party, or even mainly for that reason. I believed that communism could be uh, defeated uh, and that it would not just collapse, that it could be um, uh, overcome. What I did not believe when I was an active anti-communist is that some new technology would destroy 
communism. Many people at the time said that um, the photocopier would do it because it would enable anti-communist literature to be more easily disseminated later. People said that the video camera and video recording would do it and that um, uh, that would, when if, if communist or uh, the atrocities committed by communist or near-communist regimes, neo-communist regimes like that in China, were photographed, uh, filmed, then that would um, cause a collapse in the regime. Well, we had Tiananmen Square. Uh, everybody's seen the, that, that footage, and it did not um, cause any such collapse. Um, um, so technology isn't liberating, and it, of course it could also be used for atrocious purposes, the worst of all being, of course, the Holocaust, and that colossal genocide would have been much harder to uh, uh, commit if there hadn't been telegraphs and telephones and filing systems, for example. And Zyklon B and and, and other, Zyklon B. other uh, killing, killing things. Killing devices, other devices of industrial killing, let's say, if I can use that horrible term. It would have been harder to do, and um, there have been pogroms throughout history, but that kind of vast... Europe-wide, it couldn't have been implemented. So um, uh, there is uh, progress in science. Um, I think that's just a fact. And there is corresponding progress in technology in the sense that technologies get more reliable, they get more powerful, they enable human beings to do more things. But all these technologies don't add up to um, progress in, in, in civilization, in ethics and politics. I take the old-fashioned view, versions of which most people in the entire world took up uh, to, took until about 1720 or something like that, 1750. I take the old-fashioned view that civilizations acquire different tools, let's say, in their lifetimes, but that civilizations uh, uh, and uh, run in cycles. They 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 are born. They grow up. Uh, they reach a peak, and then they start dying. Uh, and as they uh, and and they're replaced then by periods of barbarism, pe uh, periods of barbarism, including in modern times, periods of modern barbarism. And uh, when they're at their peak, civilizations can be peaceful. They can have a lot of learning, even before modern science. They can be they can be highly learned, have great libraries, and, and so on. Uh, they can uh, uh, um, uh, avoid some of the worst human evils of uh, mass murder and uh, oppression. But then they start to decay, uh, and as they go downhill, um, various evils get. Uh, embedded and bound up with them, they become less peaceful, they become less learned, uh, the libraries are destroyed, or, uh, burnt down or ignored, and uh, uh, eventually the, thing, the civilization either disappears or turns into barbarism, and then later the cycle is repeated. Now that view now is considered so intolerably depressing that no one wants to think about it, but pretty well everybody in the entire world took that view all versions of it. There was even in Christ, even in Christianity, people believed, believed in what they called um, original original sin, and many of these people led sort of reasonable lives. So it's it's a modern weakness to reject the cyclical view or uh, this cyclical view of history, which I think corresponds better with human experience. So very few people ante anticipated how bad Nazism would be in the middle of Europe. They said, um, how could Europe, then the greatest world civilization, produce something uh, which was as monstrous as Nazism then became? And very few people, in my view, uh, although it didn't commit the very worst crimes, um, appreciated how bad um, uh, Soviet communism would be. Um, uh, uh, and yet, we see uh, what what actually happened? We see the um, barbarism with a modern face, barbarism with modern technologies, um, enabling uh, the regimes and their supporters, of course, to uh, commit or support crimes much bigger, much greater, and in some cases more terrible um, than in any of the past. So that view, which that kind of cyclical view of history, you find it in writers like Machiavelli, in ancient Greek and Roman historians. Some writers, as I say, apart from Machiavelli, in the early modern period, then it kind of dies out more or less. That's what nearly all human beings believed until a few hundred years ago. And I think, as in many cases, I'm not a postmodernist, but sometimes I think I'm a pre-modernist. Mm -hmm. um, I think the ancient writers, the ancient thinkers, religious or not, were in many ways 
more truthful, more realistic and more uh, accurate than later ones. That's what everyone believed and that's what I believe. So I'm going to say something nice about your book and then I'm going to say something <laughs> um, well, it's challenging, not critical, but challenging. So yeah. when I said that the book was jarring and, and very uh, uh, powerful to read for me, it forced me to, to realize that my view of human progress was dogmatic, that it had a mm. religious nature. It came mm. perhaps from my religious – my actual religious beliefs mm. or my study of economics, mm. the idea that e economists through the right policies can transform society. And it came from my view of the 20th century where I think the human standard of living increased probably something on the order of 25 to 30 times with a corresponding – not of the same magnitude, but an increase in – uh, longevity and the quality of life uh, through the incentives of, a f of free market capitalism. Uh, and, and of course, we don't have literally free market capitalism, but through market forces that there'd been an enormous improvement in, in human well-being over the 20th century. And of course, when you, if you'd said to me, well, well what about the Nazis <laughs> or what about the gulag? I would have said, oh, well, that, yeah, that, that's, that's the bad kind. That, that, that's the kind of human activity. And, and of course – and we had Chuck Klosterman on this program talking about, uh, but what if we're wrong? And and he asks the question in that book. It's a very provocative and thought thoughtful book. He says, how many of the things that we, quote, know are true today will turn out not to be true? In, because well, we I realize – we yeah. Well, we realize that many of the things that people in the past thought were true weren't. So, so, so things are going to come along that are going to reverse what we think are true. One of the but things. It's not only that, Russ. It's not only that. I mean, I ask a different question. How many evils, which we think have been safely Same. consigned exactly. to the past, so. won't will in fact come back? And um, here's two. Uh, I think you'll agree with both. Um, um, I know what you're going to say. Go ahead. Well, two. Uh, well, the uh, um, uh, return of the practice of torture. Yep. Um, fall in the Iraq war and later was something unexpected by practically everyone. Although I have to say, I have to blow my own trumpet a little bit in this. I published a spoof article in the London uh, New Statesman um, called uh, A Modest Proposal on Torture, saying that if we were going to liberate the world and put human rights, this was before the invasion actually happened, but when it was clear that it would, the article appeared in February 2003. The invasion started in March, I think. Uh, I said, if we're going to liberate the world and make it a more, the whole world a modern democracy, we, we should probably use modern techniques, and that would include modernizing torture. So I predicted that it would be used in that war. Um, uh, now, at the time, people thought that was the darkest possible pessimism, misanthropy, nihilism. It was just pure mischief on my part. But um, uh, a few, later, a few uh, uh, months later, of course, Abu Ghraib burst into the news. And I'm not convinced to this day that uh, torture has been eradicated from, this, from the system. I think bringing it back especially by the world's greatest liberal democracy, had a long-term damaging effect. The second, of course, is, the second example, which I've also written about in more recent times, is the return in Europe and in Britain and at the highest levels of politics of anti-Semitism. How many people predicted that? Well, I thought, um, you gonna, I thought you were going to say slavery, which you talk about in your book, which I think is equally well, then that's a third. much that's more disturbing. Third. Um, uh, well, I think they're all disturbing, but uh, uh, slavery in the Gulag and, of course, in China uh, and in Nazi Germany on an absolutely colossal scale uh, um, was a 20th century phenomenon and uh, in form in other forms um, uh, uh, continues. Uh, yeah, we still have a human uh, trafficking the, problem. We have human trafficking. Not, not, not on the same all. scale. It's no, not trivial. It's still but horrible. And it's, <laughs> it's still horrible, and it's not quite. It's not on the scale of Nazi Germany and uh, the former Soviet so, Union, but it's it's still a problem. So, and um, what I what I've said all along is these evils um, come back, but they're normally called in a slightly different form. But they're normally called something else. So, torture was called enhanced interrogation. Slavery is called 
human trafficking, uh, a vast system of slavery is called socialist construction. Forced labor. Yeah. Forced labor, but it's slavery, all right. And um, this leads me to, again, one of my observations, which um, is simply that bad ideas and bad practices don't slowly disappear in a process of gradual evolution or reform. But do we, get uh, any, do we get any credit for being ashamed of them? The fact that many, many Americans were very upset about Abu Ghraib and, and spoke out about it? They get credit, but on the other hand, there are uh, quite a few people now who in Britain and I think in America as well are beginning to turn back as I long expected as a strong anti-communist. I mean, when I, when I supported the defeat of communism, I was very pleased that it happened in the Soviet Union. I still am. But from 1989 onwards, I attacked the Fukuyama view and the view of many others. From actually October 1989, I attacked the Fukuyama view that this is a victory and it's a permanent victory. There are no permanent victories in ethics and politics, none, literally none. And what's happening now, which I must say, I find bitterly amusing in the most horrible way in Britain, I know about it better, is people are uh, beginning, returning to the illusions of the 1920s and 1930s about communism. There have been recent claims yeah. that, the, we have that the, gulag, <laughs> yeah, the gulag was a very compassionate institution, as we, uh, a, a British student group has said. Yeah, that was very last compassionate. week. Yeah, that, was that was last week. Yeah, that was rather, well, that, those who do not read history are condemned to uh, keep embracing the worst parts of it, for sure. Well, or, you know, repeating it for the rest of us. I mean, if they want to repeat it for themselves, that's their lookout. I don't care what they do with yeah. their lives. But if they are going to allow or encourage or permit a reintroduction of these horrible systems, which have predictably bad effects, that's something we've learned from history. But um, it's not just that they're ignorant of history. Here's the medieval, there's a med invincible ignorance. They don't want to know about history because it would destroy their hopes and illusions. Yeah. Uh, they, 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 so uh, you can't give them any evidence that will ever persuade them that what they believe about this is false. Let me give you the simplest example. I, don't, I mean, I rarely write on this at any length now, though I occasionally mention it, but I, the reason I don't write on it at any length is a waste of time. Um, nearly all Western progressive thinkers not just the present generation, but previous ones, will tell you confidently that large-scale serious repression began in the Soviet Union only under Stalin. I know. Yeah. It didn't. It began, to, it began the moment the Bolsheviks took power uh, under Lenin, and that can be extensively documented and has been. So there's no, there's no sort of, um, you know, the, the, it, it was easier to document after the Soviet Union fell because lots of documents, lots of, uh, uh, which had been locked up before became available, but actually it was known all along from emigre reports and others that this was so. But the Western left, the Western progressive left, just didn't want to know, and they don't want to know now, and they will never want to know. So there will always be, I mean, this is a bit depressing for someone who is, a, uh, you know, for, for most people, I think it's just a fact you've got to get used to, that um, the fantasies and illusions of Western leftism about communism were due for a revival um, uh, as um, uh, it became more distant, that period, and as capitalism got into a bit of trouble. So I began to expect that this would happen, and it happened in a really um, uh, grotesquely comical, though also tragically in human form because after all not only were millions of did millions of people die in these gulag systems but far more people had their lives irreparably broken they survived and even got back into society but their health was shattered their loved ones had died or, or disappeared in some sort of way even though they lived on for a few more years or decades their lives had been broken so this was a vast human crime which is now being celebrated by the jeunesse doré, the glittering young radicals uh, of New York and London and uh, uh, Paris. What did you call, uh, the, what did you call the, the, the jeunesse what? The jeunesse doré means just the golden youth. Oh, oré, okay. Duré. Oh, duré. Uh, uh, oh, uh, the jeunesse doré. So yeah. doré, yeah. that's from gold. Uh, yeah. jeunesse, they're celebrating this. They've, they've started to celebrate it again as a... As a great um, landmark in um, in human progress, in human progress. Let's, so the so the um, so I, I anticipated that, and I expected. I'm not surprised by it. I'm 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 still 
uh, disgusted by it because it. Um, but I'm not. I'm not at all surprised that that this has happened. And worse will be yet to come. Uh, and I say that again, not out of pessimism, but this is what always happens because the the people who defend some version of capitalism. I'm not, and actually never was, even though I supported Hayek. It's, I was never a kind of radical free marketeer, but I think um, the point is to have some intelligent form or forms of capitalism. Um, and that central planning, for reasons that Hayek explained, um, doesn't and never never will work, not even when aided by computers, and also has many costs in 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 um, in in, in uh, human freedom. But if capitalism, Western capitalism in its present form, goes into deeper difficulties, then these views will get a lot more wide support, even though they're demonstrably false. Um, and uh, we could even have um, Western governments, even in Britain, even in Britain, there's something like a third to a half chance, a 30% to a 50% chance that we'd have a Corbyn government in the next few years. Uh, in other words, a 30 to 50% chance of absolute catastrophe, in my view. Um, despite everything that has been proved uh, about the workings of communist governments and communist um, uh, societies. And of course, that illustrates my earlier point. Knowledge grows, humans stay the same. Knowledge grows, but humans do not become more reasonable. That's the confusion in um, Western, not only communist, but liberal thinking. They think that as knowledge grows, humans become more reasonable and more civilized. They don't, they remain exactly the same. And, 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 that, um, and that includes remaining the same, needing consoling stories or which um, kind of uh, give meaning to their lives. Now, I'll just say something important about myths. Uh, myths are indispensable in human life. What I call myths and what I think you earlier on called allegories um, are indispensable in human life. Uh, the idea that we can do without them is itself a myth. Only people who aren't aware of the myths they're living by tell you that myths can be abolished. But there can be um, uh, good myths and bad myths, sort of better and worse myths. There can be shallow myths, silly myths, and even myths that are positively poisonous and harmful because they depend upon demonizing some section of the human um, species. And um, the myths of the benign character of communism, um, uh, that it had pure beginnings when it was somehow uh, um, went away from them to, to tyranny and that uh, under Lenin, a noble, saintly uh, uh, figure who only wanted good for, for humanity and wasn't at all ruthless and so on, and, and then was taken over by the evil Stalin and so on. They're all very harmful myths. They're, they're shallow and silly myths, and they contain empirical propositions, which are false, but even as pure myths as stories, they're absolutely silly because they don't correspond with the repeated and deep human experience in which large-scale radical uh, human projects of reconstructing society according to an, an ideally better model uh, normally, I would say, always lead to um, dreadful results. Well, it was a cheerful thought. Um, I think correct. <laughs> I, I, I just remind listeners of the conversation I had with Milton Friedman shortly before his death on Econ Talk when I asked him about, isn't it at least cheering that, it make, doesn't it make you feel good that despite high prices of, say, oil or whatever it was at the time, mm. I said there's no demand for price controls. And I, maybe people have, maybe we've had some impact as economists. We've taught people they don't work very well. And he said, no, I don't think so. I think it's because too many people were alive in the 70s when we had price controls. They saw how bad they were when those people die. And it's Absolutely. not part of human memory anymore. There'll be a clamor for them once again. And it's the, the same phenomenon. And I so, agree with him completely. So I agree, I agree with, with that. Milton Friedman on that. I, I, I agree with that, and I agree, unfortunately, or I'm sympathetic to it. But I want you to answer a tougher challenge, which is uh, the extraordinary transformation of of human material well being. Mm -hmm. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's only material well being. It's not spiritual well-being, ethical well-being. But we do have, I think, uh, when you said that that you're a man of the 1720s, uh, the reason I think that the view of progress became took hold is because there was material progress. The Industrial Revolution, although yeah, yeah. painful and, 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 and created a lot of suffering, eventually for the next generations that came after, led to a, a, a very strong reduction in 
in economic insecurity and at least in in material in starvation. And we live in a world today where hundreds of millions of people have escaped the worst kinds of poverty. They're still somewhat poor. Uh, Many of us, I would include you in this group and I would include myself, live an an immensely more pleasant life, both in the workday and in uh, in our leisure time. We live longer. The quality of that longer life is often more pleasant. Now, I concede that I still suffer, uh, mm. even even mm. with my high income. I still have emotional challenges. I still have um, the imperfection of human consciousness that you talk about quite eloquently, that I'm aware of my own. Maybe it was, it was Schopenhauer who was, or Spinoza, I can't remember who you write about. Obviously, we, we struggle to deal with the fact that we are animals living in a very material world and yet strive sometimes to be something greater than that and often fail. So that's all true, but you do agree that there's been progress on material grounds. There's been a huge increase of what could broadly be called material wealth uh, over the last few hundred years, and I don't deny that either because that's part of the spin-off from science and from technology. I mean, uh, these new, um, uh, this huge increase in consumption and in the level of uh, daily, uh, Comfort. the comforts of daily, yeah. comforts of daily existence and so on. I don't have to wash uh, my clothes. I don't have to haul yeah. the water from the... Yeah. They're nearly all spin-offs from yep. new technologies, which in turn are spin-offs from the growth of knowledge. So that's uh, progress. But, but, I'd say, also, uh, but you have to be fair. There are also spinoffs of the economic and political systems that are put in place in yes, places well, that that's don't have become, those. Yes, doing that's, so where well. I beca- but that's where I become much more skeptical. You okay. see, I think you should be, you should be too Later. with your stronger with your stronger than my my belief in the uh, uh, benign consequences of economics and in your strong belief in. Free markets. I'll just say a couple of things about that. First of all, I just have, John, uh, oh, John, I just have to make it clear. I, I'm, I really don't have a strong belief in the benign nature of economics. I'm increasingly concerned yeah. about the aspects of, of our economic theories and how they damage us. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, that's also that. I'm glad that's the case. Uh, but even to the extent that, um, that well, let me, let me give my observation of the way Go I thought it. First of all, I think the last two or 300 years is a very short time span. If you look out through the longer period, uh, um, perspective of human history, you find many examples of uh, civilizations that grew up and achieved higher levels of um, uh, uh, material progress than they had in the past. I mean, Rome at its peak was much more highly developed than it was five or six hundred years before it reached its peak. They had what we call central heating. They had public baths. They had uh, uh, large libraries. They had uh, these were all primitive by modern conditions, but by comparison with what um, they'd had a few hundred years before, they were at a much higher level. And then, of course, Rome collapsed. And so, uh, in the city of Bath, where I live. It was a, a great Roman um, outpost with uh, um, uh, Roman baths, which, by the way, still work, unlike many more recent baths uh, that have been built in later times. You can still go down there and bathe in them. They're a tourist attraction. but uh, um, And were replaced by much lower levels of, um, when Rome collapsed, much lower levels of everyday comfort and technology. And, and of course, cons- consequently, in many parts of Europe or where, uh, and other places in the world where the Romans had ruled by lower levels of human population too. Um, so that fell off, and that's how many the Aztecs collapsed. You some attribute that to the Spanish conquistadors, but there are many Mesoamerican civilizations that have collapsed. If you look at the longer run of human history, um, there have been many periods of technological advance. Uh, quite quite remarkable technological advance. It'd be very different living in Rome at its peak, at least if you were a full Roman citizen and not a slave, um, than living in uh, uh, what they called barbarism, uh, which preceded it and which still existed um, in parts of the Roman Empire or on the edges of the Roman Empire. It'd be a very different experience um, and a much better experience, but it collapsed. So if one isn't sort of blindsided by looking back only two or three hundred years, and if one doesn't think that what has been achieved on a more global level 
uh, has to has to last and endure, uh, um, then you can see that this could there could be major setbacks. And of course, there were in the 20th century. The setback which followed the First World War and the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia was colossal. They didn't get back to anything. M- sorry, or Weimar. To, to, the Weimar Republic and the the post and the Weimar Republic, yeah. but in the case of Russia, they didn't get back to um, late czarist levels of, of production and consumption till about the 1960s or later. So that, um, may, be, that after, may be true. I, I I would push. I mean, I think it's an open question. I think it's good to think about it. It's good to be agnostic about the potential for future technology be passed on and how important that is. I, I would have thought you'd have pushed harder on the idea that technology is distancing ourselves from each other, from human connection, that we don't have any more happiness. We just have a no, lot more I, stuff. I don't, I don't sort of push that, that hard uh, on that. It may, it may well be true. And of course, when the internet became, which started, as we both know, as a Cold War military tool, but when it became, uh, started entering into everyday life, I said things which were considered very pessimistic. I said, uh, one of the things that this might do, I'm talking about 10 or 15 years ago, is abolish privacy or make it much more difficult to achieve. Privacy will become a luxury good of the rich if anybody can have it, which is doubtful. Um, It will encourage living in a virtual world and less caring about the human world. I did not anticipate, I did not anticipate the virulence and rancor of Twitter debate for example, if yeah. it can be called debate. I did not anticipate that, but that's... So it has all these negative uh, um, uh, sides to it, uh, uh, all these negative... Um, uh, all, it's associated with these evils, but I'm, I'm not, as it were, pushing so much on that. I mean, I would, I would grant you, in a sense, for the purpose of our interesting discussion, that the, the overall effect of material well-being has been uh, uh, very high, even though, as you say, the Industrial Revolution was very painful and so on and so forth for, for large numbers of people that later on it increased the standard of living of um, practically everyone, everyone. But you see, I think there's an inconsistency or at least tension in your view, because while allowing that bad human ideas come back uh, in history, which you have done, or bad human practices, if you apply this to economics, then you can sort of more or less predict that uh, uh, policies which in economic terms are based on sheer fallacies, sheer errors, will be readopted. Um, so again, I'm not oh, yeah, sure if, if, if you're on the Trump left. Protectionism. Well, yeah, Sorry? if you're on the left, um, yeah. it's, it's easy to find pro- pro- uh, policies you think are horrible that have been come back. I, there's all books written about them. I'm not going to advertise them. Yeah, but on, on the, the right, right too, same I mean, thing. Oh no, same thing. The right says, "Oh, I'll, you just talked about it. How the, you know central planning, Keynesianism." Uh, some people would disagree. They'd say that those are actually I'm more good favorable ideas, to Keynes yeah. than you are. But but protectionism is the best example. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, protectionism is one of the um, uh, ideas that's been most comprehensively, uh, the, the theoretical foundations of which have been most comprehensively destroyed, and by economics, by economists and others. And uh, but it's 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 back at least as a set of proposals, which whether or not they eventuate in a full-scale trade war and in the breakdown of world trade, whether or not that happens, have certainly already had some damaging effects. So, um, so uh, that's, and of course, one other big thing that's sort of uh, missing. So what one thing which I think is missing is the way in which in politics, uh, ideas that have been, uh, I'm not talking about religious ideas, but here ideas in so to speak, secular sciences, such as uh, economics, which have long been discredited, long been discredited, come back uh, 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 as, as bad ideas very often do and make the world worse than it's been. That's actually happening now in the case of, uh, it's happening with the world's biggest uh, 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 trading, or not the biggest, with the world's biggest economy, uh, the one on which the global trading order has depended yep. since the Second World War, and so the outcome is very uncertain. So, you, uh, so although I, I, I'm far from thinking that we're on an inexorable slope to the 1930s, I don't think that yet. If we get a second Trump term, if things go wrong in the uh, bickering and conflict with China over these issues, then we could, but we're not quite there yet. But we're at a point of considerable risk. And that illustrates the general point that when bad ideas come back, 
the cycle of arising prosperity can be disrupted. And of course, uh, and we, we can go to much lower levels of prosperity. When you get revolutionary regimes, here's an example, Venezuela. Yeah. Venezuela went from being one of the uh, richer countries in Latin America, a huge oil riches, to being one of the most devastated, destroyed, and desperate countries in the world, not because of any natural disaster or catastrophe, but that because idea. of a disastrously bad regime. <laughs> now, could that not happen in a bigger and more strategically important country? I think it absolutely could. That would just be a repetition of what happened in Russia. Russia was a growing economy, as you would know, from, about, from the 1880s, 1890s onwards up to about 1910. It was a fast-growing economy. Uh, um, um, uh, and uh, that was all, um, it had many things wrong with it, of course, but it was a fast, um, that all stopped, and it stopped for uh, two human generations, roughly speaking. Um, it took a hell of a long time to re recover. It really sort of, it still stopped in a way because oh, yeah. uh, um, it's declining. The, they destroyed the cultural norms and Back trusts uh, that are necessary to make a market okay, system. They've been perhaps irretrievably destroyed yeah. in that part of the world. So that can, that can happen again. But well, what, the other thing we missed out is war. And of course, even when the war, wars are entirely justified and necessary and noble, even as I think the Second World War was, um, got more doubts about the First World War, but as the Second World War was, um, um, uh, um, both of those wars actually um, uh, produced an enormous loss of material well-being in, throughout Europe and even the world. And so are we assuming with um, Pinker that there won't be major wars uh, in future. Well, won't, the wars that happen won't be exactly the same as those or even closely similar to the big world, big wars of the 20th century because we'll have new dimensions of conflict, cyber conflict, possibly genetic weapons and other dimensions of conflict that didn't exist then and possibly also because nuclear weapons may prevent some of the full-scale collisions between major powers that happened in the 20th century so that the wars will be fought as most late 20th century, as all the late 20th century wars were fought surrogates. with proxy yes. surrogates, yeah. yeah. So there might be surrogates in Syria or surrogates in, uh, in other parts of the... But they could still be enormously costly in human uh, well-being and even in material uh, um, uh, human well-being. I mean, at the end of the, one of the best parts of Keynes, by the way, you mentioned Keynes' writings, is his account of when he went to the Versailles Peace Conference in um, 1919 following the First World War, and he said he expected everybody to be worried about the fact that large parts of Europe were on the brink of starvation as large parts were in that time in 1919. He said they weren't, but they, they were concerned to score points with each other and uh, um, against each other and to um, get uh, onerous war reparations against the Germans, which he thought perhaps rightly was a factor leading eventually to what was to Nazism coming to power. He also, um, he also by the way, of course, believed inexorably in, in economic material progress and hmm. it's an interesting question. We're not going to talk about it here. I'm just going to raise it. I, and again, your book challenges me to, to reconsider. But I assume that in the next two or three or four generations that people will be extravagantly, enormously more materially better off than I am. And that may not be true. And it's good to think about whether that's a, a view that's… And, and if so, why not? You know, is it, would it be because there's been a really unprecedentedly unprecedentedly catastrophic war. Would There's so many because, possibilities when you think about yeah, it. Which is, that, <laughs> it, it that bad economic <laughs> doctrines would take over and yeah. destroy. You'd have... Populism run amok. Um, very, I mean, all, on the rise. by the way, Keynes himself, as you know, was a neo-Malthusian. Uh, yeah, but he also... I, I'm, I'm drawing on his... Uh, his uh, but he explicitly essay. says, he explicitly says that there'll be no continuous... That the wealth of the growing wealth will be curbed and limited, and perhaps even stopped. He maybe had if the, different periods. The I don't know if that's true. If he, I, he may have said that before at some point. He also in no, uh, not before to the towards the end of his life. Well, and he can make lessons for his grandchildren. I think that's the title. I might have it wrong, but he's very yeah, optimistic. It's in there. Yeah, well, the but uh, yeah, but he's less, whether it's optimism or pessimism is less important, I think, than whether it's true. But anyway, there are various reasons why four generations from now. Um, the level of material well-being of the human species may not be much higher and may, may even be significantly lower. And what I'm saying is that if you uh, take the long run, 
the long run of the last 3,000 years, say. Oh, that's which a data is, set. That's good. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <It's> well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you look at all the civilizations that have grown up and, and gotten richer and didn't remain stagnant, we tend to think that only Western That's That's only because Adam is. Smith hadn't been born yet. Once Adam Smith was born, once, and of course he didn't create all the ideas or maybe even all, hardly any of them. But once the wealth of nations became the dominant uh, view of the world for a few hundred years, it, that did have an impact. Well, here we differ, but uh, Why? We, we, let's not get it. Um, I, I don't think that the um, uh, I don't think that the growth of modern capitalism was dependent on uh, those ideas. Oh, I agree. No, uh, no, I'm, I, that's why I joked and said some of them weren't yeah, what it is. And, yeah, but certainly yeah. the, the growth of, of trade, exchange – mediated by prices uh, and property rights had a positive impact on human well-being. You can debate what generally, else you to go with Generally, it. although, you know, you might or might not agree with it. I think it's actually a fact, though. It's a fact that, for example, that with the growth of uh, cotton production in Britain, and uh, Brit I'm not a, I'm a, a person thinking of the left, but I think this is just true. Uh, it's not just a Marxian. There aren't Marxian facts and non-Marxian facts. <laughs> there are just facts. And it's a fact that uh, uh, before British colonialism in India, um, the level of production and uh, uh, level of production consumption in India was incomparably higher than it was a hundred years later. So India was kind of one of the two great centres of world uh, um, of the world economy. Although the world economy, of course, didn't exist in a global sense at that time, and that shrank. So actually, although I don't take the view that at all that Western prosperity depended on colonialism. Um, some liberals did towards the end of the 20th century, yes. the end of the 19th century. I don't take that for you. I do think that as parts of the West grew to higher levels of, um, of production consumption, parts of the colonial world, British and otherwise, the very worst were parts of the world, like, for example, the Belgian Congo, where about a fifth of the population perished. Yeah. Uh, so that's a pretty dramatic drop in human well-being. Um, uh, um, there's, there's no, uh, um, the part we agree the others on, went down. The part we agree the on. Other John, parts of the world doing this. Sorry, go on. No, the part we agree on, and I and I we recently talked about this with Paul Bloom, the Yale psychologist, is that I am very um, uh, much in agreement that the darkness of the human heart is unchanged and its mm. potential for. Uh, destruction, the human potential for destruction is unchanged. But I, put it, I, I agree with that fully, but I put it in a slightly different way, uh, uh, more amenable to um, maybe secular rationalists. The credibility of the human animal doesn't change. The which? Oh, the, sorry, the credulity of yes. the human animal well, doesn't change. There's not, much so incentive, having, there's not much incentive to care about what's true. So, uh, Usually, especially when the truth is difficult or yep. painful, yep. none at all. So let me let me and, I want to take us in let me take us to a direction on on morality because this is this is related to this point and I, I want to let, let you talk about what you say in your book about it. You, you, yeah. you, at one point uh, you paraphrase or quote uh, Ivan Karamazov from Dostoevsky's yeah. uh, the Brothers Karamazov yeah. and you say um, he says uh, without God everything is permitted mm. Mm. and the. I think a lot of secular humanists and the new atheists especially believe that a morality can be fashioned without God. Mm. And you can also argue – I'm not going to – I'm a religious person, but obviously you could argue that, that religious morality has many flaws. So I'm not going to – that's not where I'm talking that about. Not what? I didn't catch that last It has many flaws. You can argue that, that what has many flaws? religious morality. So, yes, yes. So yes. That, that obviously there's much to talk about there, but I think most – I think most people who reject religion believe earnestly that there that a morality can be fashioned without a lawgiver, without the divine uh, creator. And you're extremely dismissive, despite your atheism. You're dis, you're extremely dismissive dismissive of that. Why? No, I'm not dismissive of the view that um, there can be morality, or I would say moralities without a divine lawgiver or without um, God. I'm not dismissive of that because, as I said earlier, most uh, religions are actually, or without religion, not the morality is without religions, but because most religions are atheist in the sense that we discussed at the beginning of our 
conversation. They don't have a creator God. Um, they don't have a divine lawgiver. This is all monotheism. You see, uh, this is all parochialism, essentially, on the part of atheists. That that Western atheism is is a continuation of monotheism by other means. But um, uh, what I focus on in the book uh, more is the fact. Again, it's just a fact that uh, atheists who say that well, we can have a we can have morality without religion. They assume the morality of liberalism broadly, a liberal morality, which in many ways is inherited from aspects of Jewish and Christian monotheism. Uh, that's what atheists today assume. Uh, but that's because they're extremely parochial and know nothing about the history of atheism more generally. If you went back to 1900 in London or Berlin or Prague uh, 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 or um, uh, um, any other big European city or for that matter New York, you'd find most atheists at that time held to a version of morality in which white people were superior to black people. Um, in other words, they held to versions of um, a racist morality. Closer to our time, you'll find that some atheists think that uh, who think that morality is, uh, many atheists, maybe most atheists, who think that morality can exist and thrive without religion, think of morality in terms of sympathy and altruism. Yep. But the most influential atheist writer of the late 20th and early 21st century, who is in fact Ayn Rand, I mean, she's sniffed at, sneered at by, rightly, I think, by philosophers, but she's by far the be sold more copies, the books have sold more copies than any of theirs uh, by many, many factors. And also, she continues to have, her writings still continue to have an impact in politics, which none of these other atheists did in the 19th century. There was Marx and Bakunin and so on, but in the 20th, late 20th, nearly 20th century, in Rand is significant. She thought that the essence of a good morality was egoism, and she detested altruism. Um, um, the term altruism was invented by the word altruism, uh, or the French version of it was invented by the 19th century uh, French positivist um, uh, um, um, uh, Auguste Comte, who invented what he called, I didn't call it this, the religion of humanity, and he said explicitly, uh, we need a new religion in which we worship humanity, not the supreme being, or as he then went up to say, humanity becomes the supreme being. And he thought that the morality that went with that was altruism, the word he invented. Um, but so there are, what you find if you just look at the history of um, atheism in different countries, even over the, just the last few decades, but certainly over the last 100 or 200 years, you find that there are many, many different varieties of atheist morality. There are athe and atheist politics as well. There are atheists who, like Rand, who like laissez-faire capitalism. There are atheists like Marx who abominate it. There are atheists uh, who are, uh, believe in human equality, uh, like um, uh, John Stuart Mill. And there are atheists, many, many of them, uh, until the Second World War, who um, believe in human inequality and who were out-and-out -out racists, including some of the well-known figures in British atheism, like Julian Huxley. In the early 30s, he wrote that Negroes, as he called, he called them, were called uh, uh, people of uh, different ethnic backgrounds in Africa and elsewhere. He, called, he said we had inferior were inferior specimens in terms of uh, possible development and intellect. Then as we get closer to the war, you find them saying in about 1936 or 7 that race actually isn't a scientific concept. Now, what had happened in the intervening three or four years? Nothing scientific. What had happened is that some of the terrible consequences, even before the war, of these dreadful theories being implemented were becoming um, more evident. So my yeah. point is this, and my point is this, when people say there can be morality without God, or, my, or when people repeat this over, I found this a completely boring, mawkish, pointless discussion, because it's all based on the idea that the morality, which is that the morality they're talking about is the liberal morality. The right one. Sorry? The right one. The one, the good one. We'll have the good morality, the kind that I believe. It's the morality, <laughs> well, it's the morality that they take for granted. Just as thirty years ago, uh, just as a hundred years ago, maybe they would have taken uh, 
racism for granted. Uh, some of them would have been Bolsheviks. Some of them would have been Nietzscheans and proto-Nazis. Um, key point, historically speaking, most atheists in the history of modern Western atheism have not been liberals. They've been anti-liberals, most now, so in other words, I don't give them any credit for picking a good morality because it's simply the one they have grew up with and they've never thought about it. They think that morality and their morality are the same things. But being skeptical, as I think we all should be, I can easily imagine 30 or 40 years hence, I can imagine the worst kinds of racism coming back. And I can imagine the brightest atheists of the time being, being racist, just as they were 100 years ago. So it's chance. You see, Nietzsche had a rather good um, observation on Christianity. He said, Christian, Christians always believe what the rest of the world believes at the time in ethics and, and politics, but with a kind of inflection of a religious inflection. Atheists are exactly the same. They always believe uh, what is the conventional view of their time uh, with a few sort of, uh, um, nearly, I mean, most atheists, nearly all atheists, atheists uh, 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 believe, believe that. So nowadays, um, a form of uh, liberal morality, or maybe several forms of it, are predominant, though, of course, more recently, these, this development of liberal morality has included imposing censorship at universities and uh, attacking people for having, sacking and attacking people for having uh, politically incorrect views. That's a kind of queer odd, uh, unusual, uh, uh, um, droll, um, perverse transformation in liberal morality. Um, but they simply replicate. And so when, for example, Harris says we can get morality from science, what he means is uh, the morality that most Americans uh, and most, many Europeans um, accept at the start of the 21st century or towards the end of the, the last last century. Uh, why it produces that particular morality is a question he's too parochial to ask. But if you're not just an everyday person living their life as best they can by their best moral lights and any religion they may have, if you're a thinker, you're, I think it's an obligation to be less parochial and to ask if I was around in 100 years ago, if I had been around, what, you know, what would I have thought then? Am I taking this morality as given, not just for practical everyday purposes, it might be legitimate, <clears throat> or more legitimate, uh, uh, but am I taking this meaning morality itself? Because clearly, the morality isn't morality itself, it's a particular kind of version of it, and it itself can have many different versions as we're now discovering, and some of them could be quite uh, importantly different. And one topic we didn't get into today, which, um, which is we don't have time for now, but uh, no. An underlying theme of the book is that uh, Judeo-Christian values and uh, meta-philosophies have infected uh, – I wouldn't the, say infected. Yeah, well, I'm, trying to, I'm just trying to yeah. be uh, a little cynical. Uh, yeah. yeah, some would say enhanced, uh, but, but have shaped atheist philosophies in ways that atheists are unaware of. And it's a very – Absolutely. It's a somewhat condescending argument, but it may be true nevertheless. Um I think the deeper point you're making right now, which is profound, is that um, uh, it's very hard to be free of your time, and you think you are. You are. There's a there's a wonderful story in the Talmud where, uh, through a, a dream, a, a rabbi encounters a, a wicked man from the past. Mm. Uh, I, I forget who it is. It's not important, but he says he says how could and he finds out he's actually a pretty decent guy. In the dream, and he says, "Well, how could you be so wicked in the past? How could you be such an idol worshiper, such a cruel person?" He said, "He said, if you had lived when I had lived, you would have you would have lifted up your robe to run more fat quickly toward towards where the idols were." Meaning, you think, "Oh, well, I wouldn't have been fill in the blank," but of course, when you're part of yeah. the times, rather difficult. So that let, let's close on this question, which is related. But to I this. just say one thing yeah, about sure. that: it's slightly worse than that in regard to the atheists or enlightened thinkers we're talking about because um, in, when in the 18th century and later in the uh, late 19th century, uh, atheists and agnostic and, uh, and other enlightened thinkers defended atheism, they gave it an intellectual prestige that it didn't have among ordinary people. For most ordinary people, it was just a set of pre-reflective prejudices and bigotries. But when Voltaire developed it and when uh, 
in actually given his anti-Semitism when Heichel, the German evolutionary thinker, claimed that races were based in science. They gave it a they gave it an intellectual standing. It didn't have otherwise. And furthermore, yes. remember, yeah. they wouldn't just be able to say, well, I was like your delightful story from the Talmud, but I was, that was the way things were then. They claimed to be the intellectual leaders of their age and of humanity. And, and so it's I, a bit different. Yeah, they're, I, not just, they're not just 18th century versions of taxi drivers or uh, 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 guys in the street or women, you know, voicing conventional prejudices. These are great minds, sometimes gen, gen, genuinely great minds, and they're giving dignity, they're giving rationality, they're giving authority to prejudices and errors that um, uh, were strong at the time, and they're claiming to be, as they all thought they were, Baltes certainly did, uh, Hay uh, Heichel certainly did, they, they're all claiming to be the leaders, the intellectual and moral leaders of humanity. So I think they bear a larger responsibility than that, that delightful story suggests. Well, fair enough. And I, I, I think it's important, and this seems like a trivial thing perhaps, but I, I think there are a lot of folks who think atheism is a new idea. Yeah, the, yeah. Good um, point. That, that a bunch Good of point. intellectuals have finally realized because of the advance of science that religion is wrong. And I've mentioned this before. I get listeners who tell me, "You're smart. Why do you? Why are you a religious person?" And and yeah. the idea that in the past, of course, people were religious only because they didn't understand everything. And now that we understand everything, of course, religion will wither and die away. But as as you point out, atheism, I think that's a form of credulity. I think I think religions are useful now as antidotes to credulity. Yeah. Well, it's gonna emerge and evolve in interesting ways, our thoughts on these things. I, I, want, to, I want to close with two questions. First question is, um, you argue that, that much of human history, not much, all of human history is cyclical, that the progress well, is there an are illusion. Well, there are periods, yes, it's all cyclical, but there are periods of drift and chaos, right. but, of course. And there's yeah. progress and then shifts back downward. What about my life? Do, do I... Do I have the potential for personal transformation? Do I have, if I wish, many of course don't wish, but if I wish to, quote, improve myself, to know myself, to grapple with my uh, flawed nature and try to be a better person, even though I may be wrong about what is a better person, but if I have an urge to do that, do you think I'm capable of that? Well, I'm pre is capable of that. I'll precede my answer by the following observation, which I'm sure you'll agree with. Both you and I are lucky. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, I wrote a long essay on it. I haven't published it yet. I'm not sure I can handle publishing it. I'm incredibly lucky. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we weren't born in uh, yeah. the Ukraine in the 1930s. Yeah, sure. Uh, we weren't born in uh, the Belgian Congo in the 1890s. Yeah. Uh, uh, there are many other ways we're both lucky. So, uh, I mean, the very... Loving fact, parents. This question, uh, <laughs> parents, education. Um, I'm lucky in having been born after the Second World War because although the Second World War caused, uh, involved, as I say, a just and to my mind even noble war, uh, involved an awful lot of human suffering and destruction. In Britain, it had many benign effects, including um, much higher levels of nutrition for people from in poor parts of society. Now, this is not a Hayek in point, it's the exact opposite. Yep, why, sure. why I don't swallow you know, the Hayek theory whole rationing during that war. We can't organize the whole economy forever as a war on the basis of a war, wartime basis. That's true. But that time rationing, which worked, it, it was blurred at the edges and there were, of course, black markets, um, as there always are, but it worked. And so diseases of deficiency, um, nutrition, nutrition diseases like rickets, which had been absolutely widespread throughout um, Britain beforehand, pretty well disappeared as a consequence of the war. So I was, I, I'm lucky and you're lucky. So the very question, can I improve myself? Do I have the personal capacity or the free will or whatever it is to improve myself? And I think presupposes maybe not the existence of uh, maybe free will, if there is such a thing as possible, or, or reality always, but the, the idea of personal self-improvement presupposes that you're living with one of the, in one of those, to my mind, comparatively rare periods of human history when self-improvement is possible. Because if self-improvement is going to be suddenly interrupted by you being arbitrarily arrested, murdered, starving in some gigantic famine, or consumed in some terrible war, you aren't going to 
be able to improve yourself very long, are you? Um, I, think so. I think Solzhenitsyn, and we're talking about Solzhenitsyn on this program lately, or Viktor Frankl, I think they would say those are the great moments when actual transformation is most possible, that many in the West who lead blessed material lives are, are no better than a, than a sheep who gets, to look, who gets to look at a cell phone and play video games on there. Yeah, the latter may be true, but it, you know the former point about um, camps may also be false. I mean, if you want a different view of this, you uh, or your listeners want a different view, they can um, read, uh, which have recently been, been published in a wonderful new edition by New York Review Press. They can read the stories of the uh, Gulag survivor, uh, Valam Shalomov. I reviewed his new book in the London New States from just a couple of weeks ago, and his view is... Um, he was offered, by the way, um, by Solzhenitsyn, who knew him and admired him, and said, Solzhenitsyn said of Shalomov, Shalomov tasted deeper in the cup of despair and degradation that we all drank in the, uh, in, in the Gulag. He said, I bow my head to Shalomov. And he offered cooperation with Shalomov, but Shalomov rejected it for whatever reasons, and Shalomov's description is of life in the camps is wholly without redemption, but neither you nor I really can judge that, I don't think. Um, Absolutely. Uh, um, I'm just being, uh, I'm being It could be both. It, it could be, it could, no, well, it could be possible in some conditions, kind of, some, some kind of tra positive transformation and impossible in others. That might be the case. Um, it could have been that even something as simple as the extreme cold of the uh, northern gold mining camps, which in which Shalomov spent 15 years, the average lifespan seems to have been in those camps about three years. He survived 15 by uh, uh, being, being being a hospital orderly for um, most of the time, because that was the, a place where there was reliable food and a certain degree of medicine and so on. But anyway, we won't. We, we don't um, necessarily. Um, um, uh, a need to go. Where were we in the conversation before well, we got to? I was asking about personal transformation. I don't. Yeah, I, but of course. I, but and I, what I, my reply was personal personal self improvement is only possible. I thought. I think. Um, I may be wrong about this. As I say, if if Frankel and others are right, I think it's well. It's only possible on a large scale. I'm sure I'm right about this. And very unusual people, heroic people, people of extraordinary qualities, can perhaps. Uh, undergo remarkable positive transformations in terrible conditions. That may well be true. It may be a universal human truth. But large numbers of people can't improve themselves um, uh, in, uh, unless they live in those relatively rare uh, parts of history which have enough stability and enough basic decency, or at least, however kind of minimal, to allow them to live lives in which uh, um, what they do affects their longer pattern of their life. If, if the pattern of your life is wholly determined by forces you can't control, by, well, that's, say, by that's like, the uh, courses. That's the fundamental yeah. question. I want, I want to, I'm, asking, I'm asking a psychological question, by the way, mm. not a material question. Not, asking, not a metaphysical question? You're not I asking am. about free will? I am. Yeah, you are, I, am. I think I your am. question is not psychological. I think it's metaphysical. That's what I meant. Sorry. I meant, can I become... I didn't. I, I want to make it clear. I'm not asking. Can I improve my lot in life by studying and becoming a better tradesperson or whatever? I'm asking the question through religion or meditation or force of will. Do you think I can become a better husband, a kinder colleague, a better friend? I think all of those means, all of the means that people, that human beings have invented in the course of their history, which might include not only religions and therapies, because we've got all kinds of yep. therapies in the uh, modern yep. period, but also arts, yep. fiction, novels, music, um, uh, all kinds of social and other practices can enable people to uh, improve themselves uh, and become more as they would want to be. I think that's just a fact, because I think one of the reasons human beings have got Maybe not the only reason, not even though, not even though it's the most important reason, but the reason human beings have the arts, have religions, have uh, uh, music, have uh, therapies, is is to do that, and to some extent, they can work. Uh, but actually, you see, here's where I might differ with um, many of your readers. I don't think, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that um, people can't turn themselves into the person they want to be. 
it may be a bad thing if what they're trying to eradicate in themselves is cruelty or some trait that is definitely malignant or malevolent. But actually, the conception of what is our understanding of what would be the best kind of person to be is very, very limited. Um, um, you see, this is kind of an aspect of my thinking, which I just, because we're coming towards the end now, uh, I think it's quite important. People say, you're terribly pessimistic, you're, you know, you see, we can never achieve our normal goals, and so on. Uh, actually, I'm more optimistic than that. I think the goals are nearly always internally flawed somehow. Um, however, absolutely ghastly, post-Soviet Russia was, it wasn't as bad as a, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a Russia which achieved communism would have been. Yeah, I agree with because that. Because a, a Russia which had achieved communism would have no religion, apart from communism. You would have ext extirpated religion. There would be no families, as we've historically understood them. There would be no national or local cultures. Uh, there'd be maybe a kind of equality, but it would, to me, be a, cult a, a culture so emptied of uh, what makes life meaningful and valuable, that it would be intolerable. Now, actually, I'm a, uh, an optimist in the sense that uh, I believe that um, those, that humans, the contradictions of human nature will always destroy, both at the personal level and at the collective level, the visions of a much better world or a perfect world that, that people have. The deepest truth in all this is that contrary to what and this is the truth in the best forms of Christianity and the best forms of Judaism and the best forms of religion is recognized in all of them, is that we humans don't have a clear conception of what it means to be perfect. We think we do. You say, what would a perfect world be like? And we can come up with some kind of rather banal description of it. But once you actually dig deeper into it, you'll find that it actually could have... It's not, uh, a, world you might, you might, it's not a world you might... That you might want, you might not want to live in such a world. So uh, you might you might you might fear such a world. You yeah. might dread such a world. You might try and get out of such a world. So that tells you that there's something in there's something lacking in that world uh, that you've you've not um, identified. So I'm although I uh, believe that human beings can and do improve themselves when they're in fortunate circumstances for long enough. Um, many do, and they become kinder, or they become uh, more reasonable, or they they, they conquer negative uh, character traits in themselves. And that's the purpose of meditation in Buddhism. It's one of the purposes of prayer in theistic religions, and it's yeah. one of the purposes of therapy that secular people take up. <laughs> they can do all those things. I'm glad that human beings cannot turn themselves into the type of human beings that they think they want to be. Because if they did, they would very often, if not always, impoverish uh, themselves, and that's because I think that kind of the one of the big illusions of our time is that human beings really understand themselves. I don't think any of us understands what leads us to do and not do uh, certain things, and that again is a good thing. Uh, very often, it may be a bad thing if you're driven to some repeatedly in what Freud called a repetition compulsion to do painful things that harm you and others. Then you'll have to seek some kind of therapy or some kind of help. But more generally, um, the fact that we don't live our lives according to a rational life plan, which is what the American philosopher John Rawls talked about. Thank God we don't live all what John Stuart Mill, the British utilitarian, he wanted us to create our lives. He said we should have experiments of living in which we try different lives and find out the one that works best and adopt that. I'm, 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 I think that's a very bad idea, actually, because if we, if we treat all our lives as an experiment, which if it doesn't seem to work out the way we want, we just scrap it and get rid of it. You could say, well, Judaism hasn't worked for me, or Christianity doesn't. I'm giving it up. Instead, I'm becoming a drug taker, or I'm becoming a, I'm becoming a, a, a follower of, uh, of Ayn Rand. I think that's a kind of uh, way of life which will, uh, of con you turn your life into a series of not very interesting short stories, uh, rather than being a deep um, human life, which can only come from committing yourself rather deeply in in daily practice to certain things, which might be a religion, or it might be uh, uh, learning an art, or a, pro or a craft of some kind, or it might be some human relationships, or even relationships with animals that you've that you've cultivated. But it has to be deep and abiding and continuing. It can't just be um, um, uh, experimental. So although, um, I mean, one thing I am very critical of is the modern, and I've written about this in them, is the modern idea of self-realization, because the modern idea of self-realization implies that there is within each of us a sort of um, 
an idea. Germinal cell, cell. yeah, mm-hmm. that we can that we can sort of extract. Um, but the but but that's just a kind of delusive image, because if you do succeed in ex- extracting something, again, you'll probably find there's something missing in it. I, I mean, pe- many people who have long been poor and suddenly become rich do not flourish in the new life that they have. Now you can say, well, that's because they don't know how to live. You know, but it's also true. People come from families and uh, social groups that have long been rich. Um, think, there's, think no that... simple, there's no simple form of a human life which can be imagined or which can possibly exist, which um, is perfection. And that means you can't approach perfection because there's no such thing. You can improve on the way you are. People can improve on the way they are and have been, but they can't approach perfection. It's not that they get a better and better understanding of what a perfect life is. We never have that understanding, and that's why, although I am myself an atheist, I think the idea of a, (coughs) excuse me, the idea of a, although I am myself an atheist, the idea of a God that can be perfect in ways that we cannot ever understand is actually a very useful and valuable myth. Well, I want to I want to close. We're way over time, but I want to close yeah. by letting you defend the kind of atheist you think one should be. You spend most of the book talking about the bad kinds of atheists, those who are who are channeling their inner Christian or inner Judeo Christian or inner messianic themes of progress or, or worshiping of something else. What's the right kind? Oh well, there are some. There are several examples in the book. I think maybe we only have time. I can look at one now in in brief detail uh, who I discuss in the book, which is the um, uh, Polish-British writer Joseph Conrad. Now, he was an atheist, a strong atheist in the sense that uh, I am, and um, uh, um, uh, but he didn't worship or even revere humanity. Um, he didn't want to replace, he didn't, wasn't looking for a surrogate for uh, a, a religious uh, theistic meaning for life. He accepted that there was no surrogate. And he was actually, I think, even pleased that religion was false. Um, um, he had very few expectations of uh, human progress. If you read his letters with, uh, that he wrote with Bertrand Russell, the British atheist philosopher, uh, Russell looking forward to a world governed by international socialism and peace and uh, we're getting better and better and so on. Um, uh, Conrad just sort of laughed at these ideas and ridiculed them and mocked them. Um, uh, he never subscribed to uh, uh, to any of them. Um, uh, but he lived a very creative and productive and adventurous life, unlike most people who even most novelists, I think, even most writers of fiction, he didn't spend most of his life in a study. He spent over 20 years as a, as a sailor, as a seaman, uh, in his late teens, at a very adventurous time when all of the world was nearly killed two or, two or three times in near, near uh, 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 drownings and uh, maritime accidents. He got involved in um, um, uh, 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 attempted coup when he was young uh, against the Spanish uh, government. Uh, uh, he became part. He, he became a gun runner for a period. Uh, he had a very adventurous life, a dangerous life, a risky life, um, and he um, and an extraordinarily demanding life in the sense that the language in which he wrote his um, uh, novels and his short stories was not his first language or even his second language. His first was Polish, his second was French. It was English, which was his third language. So he's one of the very few world-class writers who wrote in a language... I can think of two. Tw- twice removed from his first... Yeah, uh, Nabokov uh, at least didn't write in his native language. So the, those the two No, that... there are others, but he didn't... He, I mean, Nabokov didn't write in, um, say, Chinese or... Uh, yeah. uh, you know, he, uh, I mean, and also don't forget that um, Nabokov grew up at a time when the Russians of his generation all spoke French and many spoke English. He had a very demanding and arduous life. He was also constantly in, involved in speculative investments. He tried every weird, you know, Peruvian tin mines and uh, or silver mines and uh, practically everything of the day, railways a lot. He was always losing money. He was always um, hard up, even when he was earning a fortune as a, as, as a writer. Uh, he was a very adventurous character, in short. Now, what was distinctive of his... He wasn't, in other words, he was, didn't lead a privileged life. Um, you, he got rich eventually, but through his own 
and, um, exertions as a writer. Um, uh, but he didn't live a privileged life in his study, sheltered from the horrors or uh, mischances of everyday life. On the contrary, his life was as, um, uh, as or more uh, dangerous and risky uh, than many human lives were at that time. And he also, I missed out, he visited the Belgian Congo yeah. as a sailor oh, yeah. during its worst period and witnessed it. And he said it changed him forever because until he'd gone there, he had some shreds or vestiges of the European faith in progress that was dominant in his time in the pre-First World War period. He, but when he got there, he saw... Uh, um, uh, what was happening? And not only that, uh, uh, he saw that it was you know, the Belgian king of who, who owned the, as private property who owned the Congo, the, that part of the Congo at the time, called his uh, rule a mission for civilization and progress. So you know he saw what that amounted to then it changed him forever. He said that when he went to uh, the Belgian Congo, he was a, a, a mere animal, and when he left, he was a human being. I mean, it's a very nice paradox that yeah. but he arrived with all he arrived with all the illusions of civilized human beings they were destroyed and he became a real human being when he left uh without those illusions so uh um but if you say what i like about his atheism and this particular type of atheism um conrad's lack of belief in progress is central to his atheism because and it's connected with his life as a seafarer as a seaman which is that he thought that human beings were admirable. He wasn't a misanthrope. He didn't admire most human beings very much, but he wasn't a misanthrope. He thought human beings were their most admirable when they confronted situations that had no solution. I mean, uh, if you're uh, in a ship that could go under, it, everything depends on your um, uh, skill and courage, that you don't lose your nerve or the knowledge you've accumulated from other other. Um, uh, 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 sailors. There's nothing you can do to overcome the power of the sea. The sea is many, many thousands of times, millions of times more powerful than you. How you live or die, how you um, uh, save yourself from being drowning or fail to save yourself from drowning or your shipmates fail to save them uh, or help them is all up to you. And so he, he, he thought that the, 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 the type of behavior, the type of life in which human beings showed their true mettle uh, and showed real grace and real courage and real integrity, showed these admirable qualities, was, was when they were up against these kinds of uh, odds. So, you know, if you're, if you're sort of against this storm, it's no good thinking, well, uh, 200 years from now, there'll be ships that don't sink in conditions like that. <laughs> you and the people you care for are going to drown anyway. Uh, or there may be something you can do to stop them drowning. Uh, there may be some uh, measure, some brave measure that you can try, some, some human ingenuity that you can put to work, uh, whereby you can save them. That's what matters, not how people may or may not be 200 years' time when technology has produced ships that don't sink in that kind of condition. So um, he's one I dwell on in the book. There are others too, the Spanish-American philosopher George Santayana um, and uh, several others I, I, I talk about in the book who, who embody the types of atheism, uh, one of the type of types of atheism, in Conrad's case, atheism without progress uh, that, I, that I admire. They're, they're now, they're a sort of minority, they would be now, but um, if you look at atheism, as you mentioned earlier, Russ, um, you know, atheism didn't suddenly pop up in the last hundred years with science. You can you can find versions of atheism in uh, in Lucretius, ancient Greek, and Greece and Rome, and also, as I've said, you can find it in India and and um, Chinese philosophy as well. You can find it even in Buddhism as an atheist religion. So, <clears throat> although these are all different atheisms, different types of atheism have been around for an awful long uh, time, almost since human beings started thinking, actually. So, um, uh, but in the modern period, which in the modern period, um, uh, uh, um, Conrad is uh, is is one um, is is one I admire, and is one I think, even though one can't write as well as he does, I certainly can't, and hardly any of us could, certainly not in another language. Um, we can learn from how he he dealt uh, he dealt with his with his life. He had a kind of combination of um, extreme boldness. Uh, with uh, fortitude in he lost he, 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 fortitude in 
adverse uh, in adversity. He got ill in his later years. He found writing terribly difficult. Um, um, it was an enormous struggle for him to write what he what he did. Not only a linguistic str- str- struggle, but a, a kind of conceptual struggle. He had periods following his books when he struggled to recover from the exertion of writing them. And so and despite that, he kind of, he, he, he went on. To me, he's a kind of, uh, I'm not saying he was perfect, the aspects of his personality, which no doubt uh, weren't, um, but um, uh, it embodies a kind of what atheism might mean, or did mean in his case, um, in a lived life. He lived a, a very uh, productive, creative, in most ways, admirable life um, uh, without having any big hopes of the human species now or in the future. And uh, I think that's that's admirable. My guest today has been John Gray. His book is The Seven Types of Atheism. I also enjoyed his book, The Silence of Animals, which I read in advance of this interview. And I'm about Thank to you. read Straw Dogs, which is uh, earlier still. And he's written a book on hike we might want to look at. John, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. And thank you, Russ, for a very stimulating and interesting um, conversation and one which shows you've read my books very carefully and imaginatively and you've thought about them a lot. And I'm, I'm, I'm afraid not only is that uh, uh, rare, <laughs> um, but it's also produced a very, a very uh, uh, interesting and uh, I think uh, at points uh, uh, deep and uh, thought-stirring conversation. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.